when I was named uh, press secretary to uh, Governor Carter's Alabama campaign when he was running for president, said that uh, they're going to have Wayne Greenhall as the press secretary for Alabama. And George Wallace said, over my dead body. <laughs> oh, I was anyway. <laughs> and he didn't die for a little while after that. Actually, we did become close acquaintances during his last uh, years of hanging on. And I got to talk to him or listen to him. He couldn't talk to him because he couldn't hear thunder. But uh, in my presence, he cried a few times and talked about how he wished he hadn't done all that bad stuff back when. But he did it. And a lot of it I wrote about. And I write about it in this book. Wrote the book first without, without having George Wallace in it as a main character, but then after I finished, I went back and I said, it has to, has to have Wallace. You have to have him there. So I went back and got my piles and piles and piles of notes that I had uh, saved during the years of reporting in Montgomery and created the chapters about Wallace. But he's not by far not the most interesting person in this story. There are a whole lot of others. There are a lot of uh, small personal stories that I felt like I had to include. A lot of uh, first person in this. Uh, things that happened to me when I was a young reporter covering civil rights and politics in Alabama in the 1960s and 70s. After I finished writing the book, I went back and wrote an author's note. It starts off, I look back on a world suffering from racial schizophrenia. To me, that's what it was. It was a, a time that didn't know which right end was up or the wrong end was down or what, what not. A time when people were topsy-turvy. In the aftermath of the federal court's ruling that ended legal segregated public education, most white adults in my home state of Alabama were silent, while a small minority rode nightly terrorizing black people, bombing houses and churches and castrating and killing. The silent whites simply demanded that their children go to school, come home, and stay out of trouble. But there was another reaction to the violence. That story is a long and twisting road through emotional hills and hollows as it moves around curves and through unseen pitfalls we see the number of black attorneys in Alabama increase from five to six, six to seven, and more. As the roads became bumpy and dangerous, a few white Southern attorneys blossom in Alabama and fight the good fight next to their African-American brothers and sisters. Tell the story of a young man 
who had a family who lived in a poor section of Montgomery, who felt good about himself, who felt proud at the end of the 12 month long bus boycott. Willie Edwards Jr. lived in a unpainted house without underpinning, had a little bit of heat, no indoor plumbing, had to get water down the road a piece, haul it up to the house. He had worked for years with a, a grocer where, oh, warehouse in Montgomery. On this day in January, little more than a month after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the Montgomery City Ordinance requiring segregated races on public transportation was unconstitutional. Willie was going to drive a truck for the first time drive a truck from the warehouse in North Montgomery up to North, in the north end of, of Alabama, delivering his goods to one store after another. He was proud. He'd soon get a raise. He'd been promised that he would soon have enough money to maybe move his family. Two little small children, his wife, his wife was pregnant. And he'd be able to move them out of that house into a house that's more comfortable. Excuse me. He took off that morning early, driving his truck very proud. Three Ku Klux Klansmen met in a cafe in North Montgomery called Little Kitchen. The third one came in and joined his two buddies. Told him, said, I just heard about this black man who was flirting with a white woman up in North Alabama the other day. His name was Willie or Eddie or something like that. And he drove a truck for Winn-Dixie supermarket. They decided right then that they'd go get, find this person. That evening when Willie was driving home, he stopped at a little grocery store outside of Montgomery under a light. He was checking his, his uh, daily toll, make sure that he had delivered everything that he needed to deliver to all the people. When these three Klansmen found him, jerked him out of the car, beat him in the head with a pistol, he bled profusely. They took him out to the Alabama River, this strange old bridge up there, the Tyler Goodwin Bridge, and there made him jump into the cold waters of the Alabama River, where his body was found three months later, some miles down the road, down the river, in Lowndes County by a fisherman. When his wife was told, this brought, policeman brought this box of stuff that they had found on the body, Amongst the goods was a little rusted cigarette lighter. And when she saw that, she broke into tears. She knew that was Willie because she had given, that was her Christmas present to Willie just a couple of months before. By now, she had given birth to the, their third child. When the when Willie's father 
went to the local police. They did basically nothing. Listened to him for a little bit. They said, oh, he's probably run off with somebody. There were stories like this that floated around Montgomery for months and months. Nightly, after the Supreme Court ruling in November of 1956, nightly, there were bombs, fires, houses, churches. People were carried out of their homes and beaten. People, the, the good white people that I talked about in here that just wanted peace, they turned the other way. They didn't want to, they didn't want to know about all that stuff. But it happened. Clan met daily in this little kitchen cafe and several other restaurants in downtown Montgomery. Everybody knew who they were. They were card-carrying members. They had their, their uh, forms that they filled out and signed and swore to be loyal to this outfit. In late February, two, two policemen who had been investigating throughout this entire time, a man named Jack Shouse and his partner, Tom Ward, they finally found two of them, two, two, well, they actually arrested four Klansmen. They got the goods on two of them. They actually signed confessions that they had burned houses. And in this one case, they had burned a taxi stand, black taxi stand. They brought the case to the prosecutor, the back then called cir uh, circuit solicitor in, my, in Alabama. And he looked over all the cases and he said those two he thought he could get a conviction. So they, found, they had a trial. These fellows had pretty good lawyers, best, best, in, best criminal defense team in Montgomery, Alabama. William Thetford, the district attorney and circuit solicitor, he tried the case, put Jack Shiles and his partner on the stand. They admitted the, the confessions into the record. On Friday, after three days of trial, 12 white males on the jury said not guilty. And the audience stood and applauded. Jack Shiles told me years later that he believed that if those two guys had taken the stand and had admitted doing everything that they had done, you know, sworn to statement, that that jury would have still let them go. He knew that after that, it was like a saying, you have a free card. Do not go to jail. You can do anything. Detective Shouse, who worked for years investigating a lot of these crimes, turned over big boxes full of his notes and his late partner, Tom Ward's notes, 
Tom took meticulous notes on three by five cards. Every night he would go home and he would, he would write down everything they did that day, who they talked to, who they investigated, where they went to. It's amazing the work that they did for Naw at that time. Years later, well, I'm going to digress a moment to that. I mentioned in this author's note that in the mid-50s, there were only five black attorneys in the entire state of Alabama. That's because no young black could go to law school in Alabama. If he or she wanted to go to law school, they had to go out of state. They go to Case Western Reserve in uh, Cleveland or Howard University in Washington, D.C. or other schools up there. Usually when they got there and after when they came close to graduation, they would be offered jobs by some firm up north. And they'd look around and say, you know, it's a whole lot nicer up here than it is down yonder. I'd have to fight all of those problems, all of those devils down in Dixie. But a few started coming back. They were really courageous young black attorneys who would uh, who learned that they had to look at the law and really try to change the law if they possibly could. And they knew that this was a slow way to go, but they did it. They started making a few inroads here and there. A man named J.L. Chestnut Jr. came back from Howard University, back to his hometown of Selma. Said when he crossed that Edmund Pettus Bridge going north into Selma, he felt his heart just beating hard, but he knew he knew he was here for a reason, back going back home for a reason. He's the only black attorney in Selma. Solomon C. Jr. came back to Montgomery, Alabama from Howard. One of his first clients was a young black boy whose mother kept a kitchen with hot soup and hot bread, and good food for the bus boycott people throughout the year of 1956. They knew to come to Miss Gilmore's place and she'd serve them. Her son, Mark, had an after school job and he detoured after school across a city park where two white policemen arrested him, charged him with trespassing in a city park. Solomon Say took his case, never had to go to trial. He figured out a way to get the charges dropped from this young man. Mark Gilmore never forgot that. And years later, he became one of the first black city councilmen in Montgomery. The violence in Alabama escalated throughout the late 50s and early 60s to the climax of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham when it blew up that Sunday morning and killed four little black girls. And the sound and the, the hatefulness of that crime tore into 
pour into numerous people, blacks and whites. And I show in the book one of the, one of the men that it really ripped into his heart was a man named Charles Morgan, Jr. Everybody called him Chuck, Chuck Morgan. The day after the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing, Chuck took the podium at the Young Men's Business Club in Birmingham, and he proceeded to make an impassioned speech in which he said, who's guilty of this crime? I'm guilty and you're guilty. All of you sitting here doing nothing, you're guilty. He ended his speech saying, Birmingham is not a dying city, it is a dead city. Well, Charles Morgan and his young wife, they had a little, little son, little infant son, started receiving threatening calls. They were, had the Klan run, driving around their block, scared them to death, and they ended up moving to Virginia for a year. At the end of that year, Chuck became the ACLU director for the South and was stationed here in Atlanta. Had his office down on 4 Forsyth Street downtown. In the chapter of uh, in, in Fighting the Devil in Dixie, I call the chapter about his, his return, the Don Quixote of the South. That's what Chuck was. He was the Don Quixote of the South. He would travel from one end of the South to the other, finding the injustices and trying to right the wrongs. He filed suits that integrated the prison systems in Alabama, filed the suits that integrated the jury system in federal courts throughout the South. He filed suits, <clears throat> excuse me, filed suits in Alabama that integrated many of our state institutions. He was one of the most delightful people I've ever met in my life. He talked like a poet. But he was sharp as a tack when he went, to, when he went to, into a courtroom. A young man who had just finished law school before the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, returned home to Montgomery, where he had been one of the star 4-H club members out in the country east of Montgomery. His name was Morris Deese. Morris had just opened a law practice He had not particularly planned to take on civil rights or trying to fight the devil in Dixie. But when he heard about these four little girls being killed in this bombing, he said, I'm going to do something about it. Stood before his Baptist church in Mount Meigs, Alabama, held up his check and said, I'm sending this up to these people. 
woman in the back of the room said, sit down, Bubba, you've got no business in that. He said, we're going to pray for these people, for their loss. He bowed his head and he began to pray. A few minutes later, when he opened his eyes, he saw the congregation had left. It walked out. He was left with his wife by his side, and he said, that was the beginning. Soon thereafter, he began defending poor black people, charged with crimes he thought was wrongly charged. Not long thereafter, he and a, and a partner started the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery. And they took their fight, fighting the devil in Dixie, throughout the South, throughout the entire country, actually, as it turned out. They ended up fight, filing a suit in Mobile after a young black man was picked up by two Klansmen on the streets of Mobile. He'd, he'd gone to a store to buy a pack of cigarettes for his sister. They took him out into the country and they beat him, slashed his throat, took him back into town and hanged him from a tree where everybody on their way into work the next morning would be able to see him. Morris Deese got the idea, told, told Michael Donald's mother, we'll file suit. We'll sue them for everything they have. File a suit in, in court. They met the, by this time, the Klansmen had been found guilty. This was up in the 70s. And they filed a suit and in federal court was given a judgment of six million plus dollars. Of course, the Klan didn't have six million plus dollars, but they took everything they had and basically they put them out of business. Another young man who was deeply affected by the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing was a young law student in Tuscaloosa going to the University of Alabama. His name was Bill Baxley. And when he heard about this, he, he was stunned. Couldn't imagine how anybody would do such a, a thing. But then he was even more stunned and embarrassed and, and hurtful when he saw that the police were not investigating, and if they were investigating, the prosecutors were not prosecuting. And he swore that on the spot, he said, if I am ever in a position where I can do something, I'll try to bring those people, whoever they are and however many of they are, to justice. Later, some 10 years later, he became Attorney General, State of Alabama. First day in office, he, he hired Jack Shouse, the detective I was telling you about who had been investigating these cases all the way back into the 50s. He hired Shouse and he told him, whatever we do, let's get to the bottom of that bombing. He was he went to Washington, he tried to get investigative notes from the FBI. The FBI director said, we don't have notes, Mr. Hoover. We don't have any investigation. Baxley kept on and kept on and kept on. Finally, after Hoover died, found an end and he went to it, it was a, a young a reporter from 
Alabama, who was the bureau chief for the Los Angeles Times in Washington, a man named Jack Nelson, who worked out of Atlanta for many, many years. And Jack called the FBI office and said, if you don't turn over your investigation, I'm going to start writing about it. And I'm going to start writing about it tomorrow. Funny thing, the next morning, Baxley receives a call from the Birmingham office of the FBI. We just happened to find these investigative notes that we have. These people that we interrogated and we talked to way back. If y'all want them, you can come up here and get them. Well, he wanted them and he went up there and he got them. As a result, a man named Robert Dynamite Bob Chambliss, an old known Ku Klux Klansman from Birmingham, was arrested, tried, found guilty, sentenced. He ended up dying in prison. Later, two other Klansmen were tried and found guilty. There'd been a lot of fighting the devil in Dixie, and it happened from one end to the other. And I could go on and on, many other personal stories, these people, and if y'all would like to uh, have any questions, I'd try to answer them. What's the status of the Klan today in Alabama? Basically, they were put out of business when Morris Deese got that $6 million verdict. Uh, as far, no, if they came back now under the name of the Klan, now they may be operating under some other name <laughs> that we don't know of, but under that name, if they came about, they could take their property, take whatever they had from them because that was never really satisfied. It was, uh, there was enough money there. They sold an old building and they bought Mrs. Donald a little house. And that's what she got out of it. Wants to know about the, the white people who I said uh, just wanted to send their kids to school and didn't want to know about it. A number of readers of of uh, fighting the devil in Dixie that who've come back to me in the last month that it's been out have told me, said, you know, I didn't know any of that was taking place. They said, we knew that there was something out there going on, but we really didn't know. And that, that's what I mean. Now, like my parents, my parents were good, middle class, law abiding citizens. They wanted me to be the same, and my brother to be the same. And I, I mean, and I don't mean that as any criticism. I think they, were, they did what they thought was right, and I, and I think was was right. But at the same time, when I grew up, and I saw it happening, and of course I was in a position of being a newspaper reporter, and I wrote about it. Didn't everybody like it? A lot of people didn't like it at all that I would write about this stuff. I tell about a story in here where this deputy sheriff from Elmore County killed this young man, young black man who was just home from Vietnam, riding down the road, stopped him. He hadn't committed any crime, but he stopped him because he was black and it was midnight or, or after midnight. And he ended up beating this young man, James Earl Motley, over the head with his billy club. The next morning, they claim that they put Motley in, in jail, in the Elmore County Jail. 
And the next morning it was claimed that he fell out of a bunk, hit his head on a concrete floor and killed him. And I, these witnesses, called me the next morning to tell me about it because they'd been reading some of my stuff in the paper. Thought that I might want to investigate it, which I did. And uh, I stayed on top of it. These three witnesses were three men who delivered the Montgomery Advertiser early on Sunday morning. And he had seen, they had seen the deputy sheriff take off after Motley's car. So they had followed at a distance and then they had parked and they watched. And they saw and they even followed him on to the jail. And they said when they carried Motley into the jail, they said he didn't move a muscle. So he was just a limp and the Elmo County Grand Jury no-billed that case, which meant they didn't bring any charges. That same afternoon, federal grand jury in Montgomery indicted the deputy for violating uh, Motley's civil rights under color of the law. He was tried. He took the stand and he told basically the same thing, same story that I wrote in the story in my in the paper but he was found not guilty of violating civil rights he's asking if uh, if I was ever threatened as a matter of fact after I wrote the Motley story uh, I was going into my little apartment uh, I was single back in those days an apartment was in a black uh, in a dark alleyway a little place and Somebody hit me over the head uh, with something, and I woke up and called my editor, and like I told him, I said, yeah, I didn't think about calling a doctor, I called my editor. <laughs> <laughs> he came over and he took me to the hospital, and they said I had a concussion. Another time, I was uh, covering a demonstration up in Prattville, which is just north of Montgomery. There was a lot of demonstrations back in those days, and this time I had a new camera, and I decided I was gonna carry that camera and take a few pictures. And I was walking down the sidewalk, and this little old woman, she came up, started whamming me across the head with her purse, and cussing and saying I was a Yan one of them Yankee guys who brought all this foolishness on down here. And thank goodness the policeman was right there close by and he pulled her off of me. <laughs> she let me go. He, he was asking if churches were ever a, a positive factor in this. Now and then, a white church would become involved. A lot of times when the, when the white church would do that, the, they would find a way to get rid of that minister and get him somewhere, push him off somewhere else. Now, black churches throughout the entire time, oh yeah, I mean, they were nightly, uh, particularly during the uh, bus boycott. You had mass meetings in Montgomery at least three times a week at the various churches. The ministers were, I mean, they would preach. This is one thing that Dr. King pushed very, very strongly that they had to keep this up because he knew they had to keep, keep going, keep pushing, keep people alive with the, with the spirit of, of the bus boycott. The first one after the three days after uh, Rosa Parks was arrested, I mean, there were thousands of people. I mean, they were people outside for, I mean, whole masses of people at the whole Street Baptist Church in Montgomery. Yes, sir. But just to be clear, how did the white churches justify, how did white Christian churches justify not taking the right side? Well, one thing, like, I tell the story in, in the book, my, my minister 
at a Presbyterian church in Tuscaloosa when I was a boy. I loved him dearly, and uh, he had, he'd meant much, much, much to me. And he invited uh, some black people, uh, professors from Stillman College, which was a Presbyterian school there, black Presbyterian school, invited them to worship at our church. That afternoon, the board of elders met and fired him, fired the minister. It's difficult for me to think. I, I never went back to the church. My, my mama begged me to go back. I said, I can't go back there. I can't. I mean, I, I, to me, that was just uh, the unchristian thing to do. Uh, there was a, a white minister in Montgomery through this whole time. He was a Lutheran minister. But now his, his uh, congregation was all black. The only, only whites who would come were real close friends of his or his family. <laughs> uh, there were several white ministers in smaller churches in Montgomery who spoke out, but not, not many and not very loud. Yeah, he's asking if Wallace ever was connected to the Klan. Uh, no, I don't think. He spoke to Klan, what were obvious Klan rallies. He spoke to people who were obvious members of the Klan. He had, he had very close uh, associates who were Klan members. I don't think Wallace himself ever associated himself uh, as a member of, of the group. Uh, his speechwriter, Asa Carter, had, had at one time formed his own uh, United Clan of the Confederacy. Uh, so, I mean, he was real close. He's asking if anything ever came out of the United Methodist Church, uh, which had the hierarchy up above. Um, not that I know of. I tell you the truth, I, there, it could have been that I don't know about, but ask if I know of any armed resistance to the Klan in Alabama. No, I don't. I really don't. I don't. I don't remember ever seeing, hearing, or knowing about uh, an armed resistance against them. Um, uh, you know. At King's, on King's birthday, someone asked me about him, you know, and how he was to the people of, Al of the South. And I, I made the remark that I thought that white Southerners should be very proud that Dr. King was the leader of the Civil Rights Movement because he was a man of the cloth. He was a man with a great heart. But mostly, he was a man who was against violence and preached over and over and over again. Now, there was, there was a man I write about in Fighting the Devil, John Hewlett, who became Sheriff of Lowndes County and later uh, probate judge of Lowndes County, black man. He'd gone off from his home to Birmingham and worked in the steel mills. And when the violence started against Fred Shuttlesworth, Reverend Shuttlesworth there, John Hewlett would put his shotgun in his lap and sit all night long outside of Shuttlesworth's house. White policemen would come up and ask him, say, what are you doing? What are you doing with that gun? He said, I'm just watching, waiting. Say, okay, be careful. Then in Lowndes County, when the white man killed a, an Episcopal priest there, Jonathan Daniel, remember, killed in broad open daylight. 
John Hewlett put, a, put his shotgun in the back. He had returned to Lowndes County, his home. He put a shotgun in the back of his truck and he said, now, I want you all to know, you kill one of ours, I'm gonna kill two of yours. And they must have believed him because they didn't have any more. <coughs> that was the last one. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.